setting me up. Hi guys. Om priti vide tu bomi devi om te jaz da tu odnaj om ka sa da tu si vaja om sa da tu urgaja om vaju da tu nemantaja om priti vide tu bomi devi om ground manazi ni vedi in gari mashanti om priti vide tu bomi devi om manazi ni vedi in gari mashanti Manazu ni vedi gari mashanti. Yo. I've been drinking decaf coffee the caffeinated coffee for a week and I don't miss the caffeine that's cool that's how I know I was not an addict sure looked like it <laughs> but you never know till you try it Nazim Nivedin Garimashanti get into your body incarnate. Today we speak of convection. All right, convection. We tried to define entropy for a while. And if you got it, if you understood it, then it's going to be helpful for you. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on entropy. I want to speak of convection. Convection on all planes. But we have to use what we see as an example. Okay. So if you put water into a pot, put the pot over a fire, well, you know, the oven, the stove, whatever you got, the heat. Um, will heat up the pot and of course the particles of water that are the, the most at the bottom, these particles heat up and they will rise, which causes the cold water to be pulled down because, you know, it moves. So that's the basic, the most basic example of convection that, that is used in pretty much every class or course on convection in the laws of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics. Thermo, like a thermometer, is uh, thermo is about uh, thermic temperature. Okay, heat, cold, anything about temperature. Thermodynamics. Dynamic is the motion, the interaction. Okay, so the uh, the resulting mechanical force that is deployed by the phenomenon. That's thermodynamics. So in thermodynamics, convection is this idea that heat rises. I know I'm saying it very layman, like if you, you were a kid and didn't understand anything, but someone at some point will watch that video and have little knowledge of uh, science, which is, which is okay, you know, no judgment, but I want to explain basic stuff. So if you have a heat source in your house, in Canada we have a lot of heat sources, um, if you put your hand over a radiator, you can feel a functioning radiator. You can feel the heat up, going upwards. If you put your hand under the radiator, you don't really feel the heat because heat rises. Why? Because hot particles are lighter than cold particles for the same particle type. Okay. So hot air rises in a volume of air when there's air around but when the air at the bottom rises it pushes the cold air that was above on the side which then makes it flow down and then it rotates like that okay 
that is convection. Convection is the circulation of air or liquid um, because it was provoked by a heat source okay, or a source of energy of any type. That's convection. I hope you get the basics of that, okay? Because this is really the fundamentals of the entire highly metaphysical class I'm going to give that might be complex. Entropy. The easiest way to understand entropy is to bring it to its most basic definition. Unpredictable chaos. That's entropy, okay? So when the air rises in a convecting system, all these, these particles of air move in a way that are chaotic, disorganized. Of course, they're going in the direction that, of the convecting force, but they're disorganized and you cannot predict how they will end up. We see this visually when we look at clouds. Clouds just it's water, humidity that rises. It reaches a point where it's cool enough to become water again, but stays up in the air because it's carried by, you know, atmospheric. Oh, let's not go into that. So clouds, <laughs> we don't do meteorology today. So <laughs> clouds, you see the shape they have? And as, as they move, when there's wind, they transform. They take different shapes and then you sit and you play at identifying bunnies and horses and dragons and whatever you want to see with your imagination in the shape of these clouds. That's entropy. The fact that it slowly moves in a disorganized way. It's chaotic. And you cannot predict how it will end up because it is so chaotic and not ruled by a Cartesian force that it goes wherever it wants. Okay. So, Entropy is the complete absence of Cartesian type order, okay, like linear and well, so entropy is you never really know how it's gonna end up, but it's still in general a cloud follows its convecting force um, or its weather system. Uh, heating up the hair in your home, it will follow a direction. But the organizing of the particles, if it's air that you heat up your house with, you don't see it visually. But using the cloud example helps you understand that the air around you moves with the same disorganized patterns. So every time you walk in your house, the body occupies a certain space. If you move forward, now you occupy a space where there was air, that air wrapped around you, but causing turbulence in an entropic fashion, a disorganized chaos. Okay? That's when you walk around, okay? And um, you can't see it, but you can sure smell it. If you do a fart and start walking fast, the fart is pulled behind you because it, it, it does it the entire uh, anyway, you get the point, right? <laughs> you can carry your smell around. So, <laughs> class has to be fun at one point. I didn't intend to do fart jokes, but it's an academic example. I needed it. <laughs> that was the cover of the science between con uh, on the topic of convection. Now, check this out. Wolves and meerkats. Meerkats are the cute little <sniffs> puppies in the desert. That, like there's a group of five, six that all go <sniffs> look around, standing on their legs and then going down again. Okay, that's meerkats. And wolves, I think you know what a wolf is. Um, it's a wild dog, eh, almost a canine. And there's something fascinating uh, they have a behavior that is easy to observe, where in other animal kingdoms, it's, it's still like that, but it's less obvious. In wolves and meerkats, the fact that the 
strongest people, the one with the most power, the strongest animals, okay, the alpha males and the, the, the strong ones, they will do the killing of the prey. And then they ensure an equal distribution of the food evenly. Uh, so that everyone, even the wounded and the weak ones, will eat. Okay. And they don't need the explanation about the virtue of equity or charity because it is naturally planned that food will just be distributed evenly the same way that air is distributed through convection. Okay. So once a a food source is acquired by words of meerkat, you can, you can visually observe them. The hunters eat first, but they don't eat more. <laughs> they eat a fair share. They just eat it first because their nose is in the freaking prey. Okay, <laughs> it's easy. And then they distribute, they ensure they stay there. And if someone one tries to have more than the other, they, ah, they growl and they, 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 they have a natural system of justice, of even distribution of the resource, or resource according to their needs. A pup needs to eat less than, uh, you know, an elder, even, they're, even if they're sick. So that is so cool because it is the natural resources flow in a way to even out, okay? So when you have convection in a home uh, with your heating system, the convection insert, uh, ensures that the heat will rise, but the convecting force will will eventually, with the entropy, the troubles, clouds of hot and cold air, will mix it until the temperature is pretty much even throughout the entire room or house. So convection and entropy ensures an even distribution of the heat. In the behavior of wolves and meerkat, you you can I mean with pretty much every uh, sentient animal, there's an even distribution of the resource, but it goes chaotically. Okay, so you can think that the behavior of animals is anthropic. Basically, you never really know how they're going to behave, but there will be a convection of resources. And we're not in thermodynamics anymore, but it's the same kind of feeling of convection. It will move chaotically and go in an unpredictable fashion until everyone evenly has the resources that they need. Okay. Let's raise a higher plane than that. In consciousness, soul, in karma, okay? You can't really choose when your karma will hit you, the good one, the bad one, and the neutral one, okay? Um, on the karmic plane, there's no good, bad, neutral. There's karma. But we, from this one pisses me off, this one I really enjoy, and this one I don't care, we, we label them, the good, the bad karma, and the neutral karma. But the, these labels don't exist. It's just resulting forces. On the causal plane, there's a convection of causal energy in a way that is chaotic and unpredictable but it will be and, and then there's the the equivalent of magnetism it will be attracted to uh to its opposite polarity basically so if you have a vacuum of negativity negative karma will come now let's remove the negativity and the karma, uh, the negative karma. If you have a type of experience that you have um, available inside you, a ball, then that positive force will go there. Okay, the same way that when hot air rises, it liberates place below, so it sucks in cold air, and where the hot air rised, it pushed the cold air that was there out of the way okay so um on the karmic plane is the same type of thing heat is consciousness okay the heat source is consciousness and and it's not at the bottom it's it's anywhere okay so there's no up and down on the causal plane so these heat sources will just cause these entropic motions of clouds of causality in the same way it is chaotic 
It is unpredictable. But as it goes, it will end up bringing an even amount of karma according to the availability in any sentient being that has a karmic availability, good or bad or neutral. Okay, that's cool. It's complicated, but it's freaking cool. <laughs> because karma, um, karma is not an intellectual process where some dude, you know, old dude, gray hair, fine rim glasses, and a big ancient book with a letter binding in, in some kind of Woodbrock Dales County, you know, antique place and just scribbling bad no toys for Christmas you know uh, or, or you know taking into account the bill so we we have an old idea I mean the character I just described way too much but I enjoyed it it was theatrical the character I describe is, is, is a fantasy you probably never had but we have this weird idea that there's a Cartesian intelligence that calculates the good and the bad and, the, and, and, and then some random stuff, the neutral. We have this false understanding, this, this, this preconception that there's actually a, an intellectual function, an intelligence in, in a very mechanical way that calculates if you are a good or a bad person. Or what you deserve. Like the concept of deserving is completely wrong. Deserve or not deserve. This, this does not exist. If you're a good or bad person, that does not exist. What exists is happiness and suffering. Which is cold air and hot air on the causal plane. Okay, How it is perceived by an, a sentient being. The cold and dense causality is perceived as... Uh, harsh, difficult, uh, emotionally and also sometimes spirituality from the soul. Rarely, but sometimes. Uh, when it's this, you know, deeper spiritual crisis. But otherwise, it's very human. The cold air equivalent is, is this nefarious, debt-embracing feeling on the causal plane. So it's an event that will be pulled to you and you will feel it as suffering. Just because it's that temperature. Well, there's no temperature on a causal plane, but it's, it's the equivalent. And sometimes there's the heating or the hot causality that comes to you because you have space for that available inside you. And, um, and, and you feel it as a <sighs> liberating because hot hair takes more space, so it fills you. The hot karma fills you. You feel plenitude, fulfilled. Okay, when it's cold, that comes, it takes less space, so it shrinks, and then you feel you feel emptied and pulled inside. Okay, it is more like a weather system. It's a law of the universe. It's not calculated. Okay, stuck in the mind. So, I hope you understood the the, the point of view of causality that there's no there's no bad karma that does not exist. Um, karma is too often compared to the Christian sin. The Christian sin is a literal anthropomorphic projection on St. Peter's with the book. Okay. And um, lately I've been writing stories, inspiring stories. Well, writing and, you know, trying to find help also, inspiration online. But writing stories, uh, one-page stories to better uh, to help us better feel what is the purpose of an archangel or what is a specific feeling of a mask of an ego and and because of that my mind is now into more elaborate dialogue and fantasy characters and you know you train it so it comes naturally when these books are published you'll you might have the pleasure of reading these little stories. They're, they're meant to, to cause a feeling inside. One is disastrous. The other is completely awesome. You know, these feelings. And um, I realized that telling little stories, um, if they're too short, 
you're still in your intellect. If they're too long, it's boring. But if it's just one page, you have just enough time to start to get into it and then bam, the revelation of the final feeling and then it's over. You, you, got, you got the point of the teaching, you know, but it's just a story. It's not real. Hopefully in 3000 years, they won't read those and say, it really happened because Maha wrote it. No, it's a story. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's invented. Causality is anthropic like any, um, anything in nature. And if you understand that, then you'll understand on the fourth plane, on the on this um, individual consciousness plane, the plane of the souls. The souls don't choose a mother and a father. The souls are moving in the winds of, of Prakamya, you know, the streams of Brahma. And it convex in a completely unpredictable and chaotic fashion. And if there's a sentient system without a soul, a, a soul, if there's space for this kind, because then it's more than hot and cold, there's also the type of component available. Um, like I explained a lot, according to laws of physics, thermodynamics, convection, entropy, but there's also the equivalent of chemistry, where one atom needs um, a compatible uh, bond with another atom to bind, and there has to be a missing ion on one and an extra ion in this one for the binding to happen. That's, let's not get into chemistry, but basically uh, chloride and uh, sodium will bind together easily, and that will make uh, sodium chloride, which is uh, salt, okay? Um, but chlorine will not easily bind on steel, especially if it's stainless, okay? Uh, stainless is made to have no available ions or, or holes, so nothing can cling onto it, okay? Uh, that's how they do stainless. They just neutralize the, uh, the, the ion balance. Um, so in the same way that you, the major, the, the macro mechanics of the motion of souls is like convection, the micro mechanics are like chemistry. So a soul needs to have the kind of feeling that is missing in the sentient body. And that sentient body must have something that the soul wants and then they, they come together. So a soul does not choose a parent. A soul chooses a context without knowing that parents are actually involved, or maybe if they're more evolved souls, but usually it's just in this scenario, I want to experience military feeling. In this scenario, there's a lot of hippie peace and love. In this scenario, they're really like afraid of aliens invading Earth. Okay, let's not do that. And this one, military, there's, there's this military feeling, okay? Dad is in the military, mom is, is the secretary of the commander, whatever. Like there's, there's a pull, this kind of experience. Because it's like chemistry. Certain types of atoms will easily bind to other types of atoms, especially if the ion balance is compatible for them to join, okay? So in a large scale, convection, in an anthropic way. And then locally, when individual karma seeks destination for karma, you, or when a soul looks for a body, or when a dharma seeks an opportunity to emancipate itself, when these planes function locally, it's more like chemistry, where now components has to be able to bind together or else it'll just flow off the surface and convection carries elsewhere. So whenever, let's say, a karma goes somewhere, it flows around, takes the form of a cloud, transforms. If it gets to a place where there's no availability for this karmic pressure, convection just keeps it flowing. So convection, in a large scale, just keeps everything stirring up. And eventually, any individual pockets of karma, the potentials, will reach a point where, will reach a place where, ah, there's an availability, chemically, like it can bind, and it just goes there. Okay. 
if you understand a bit of physics and chemistry, which are the two main fields of study, there's all, you know, quantum physics is a bit more advanced, but it's still physics in a way. So if you understand physics and chemistry, in, in the very basic, laic um, understanding, then you can understand what is above is what like what is below and what is below is what is like what is above uh, as above so below as below so above the emerald table of mercury three mages i forgot his name but anyway one of those important uh, teachings of the occult very ancient uh, was very popular in egypt and it became uh, very popular in the golden dawn and everything Every plane functions according to the same kind of laws. And for us who are human, with physical organs to see the physical plane, to understand the physical plane, to touch physical things, we think chemistry and physics, that's how it is, because we observe it, it's science. Oh, so karma is like that. Wow, that's cool. But once you're a soul, once you're very conscious as a, a being and have some sense of divinity, you know, you see it from the other side. You say, "Ah, oh, this, this, um, the, how things flow in the universe manifests physically. Physics and chemistry follow the laws of karma and the soul. You know, like you see it from the other way. The original is the higher planes." So, and as it came down, it happened, okay? So if you, if you consider the first three planes, a creator, creation, and the interaction. So the first plane is the event of manifesting, of appearing of mass or, or any energy in consciousness, the creator. The second plane is the sum of all this that is created. And the third plane is the interaction between the creator and the creation. Water, it's uh, the Father interacting with the Christ by the Holy Ghost. Brahma interacting with Vishnu through Shiva. Osiris, for the Egyptian, interacting with Horus through Isis. Um, all great religions have the same trinity, okay? In science, the source of all things is energy. Everything comes from energy, the primordial energy released in the Big Bang and that is continuously being released from vacuity into creation. So the source of all things is energy. The sum of all things manifest is matter or mass. And the interaction between energy and matter, there's an interaction. There's two, actually, it's speed and frequency. Something that goes straight is speed. Something that stands still and vibrates is frequency. One thing in the scientific world, in the manifest world, that has both a speed and a frequency is light. We call it the speed of light. Light is a frequency, but it goes at a certain speed. Okay, So the speed of light is the interaction between energy and mass. Therefore, the holy trinity of science is E equals mc square energy is equal to the mass times the speed of light okay the creation or the origin of all things the mass of all things the result is creation and the interaction speed and frequency is how everything interacts okay so brahma vishnu shiva e m c square same thing Okay, because anyone who genuinely observes the universe with no filter, no preconception, and just wants to see, will end up seeing the same thing. So in the world of science, they have seen energy, mass, speed, and frequency before the scientists look at the, uh, the, the manifest world. There was Brahma who created all things, and Vishnu, which is everything manifest. And Shiva, which is every interaction that exists. It was Eheye, Ia, and Yahweh. Osiris, Horus, and Isis. The Father, the Christ, the Holy Ghost. It's the same thing. Exactly. 
And that's, that's the origin. That's the core component that manifested everything. And then you have on the third plane Shiva, which is this universal sense of interaction. And it produced a convection, difference of temperatures, like the positive, negative, the good, the bad, the happy, the suffering. And it started to just flow in the universe. And this is just freedom. So we call it disorganized because of a judgment and chaotic because of a, uh, of a judgment. It's just free. It goes wherever it wants. It doesn't need a preconceived direction. But someone who believe in a Cartesian and structured organization will say that entropy is disorganized and chaotic. And someone who needs the security of knowing what will happen, who needs a time scale, a schedule, a deadline, a plan, a hope for the future, a fear of what might happen, someone who needs the rigidity, they won't like entropy because it is the contrary of that, unpredictable. Okay, So it's not unpredictable and chaotic per se. It simply doesn't need the security of the known. It can stay in the unknown. It doesn't need the, the rigidity of an organized system. It is just freely flowing and it goes everywhere. Everything in the universe functions like that with these basic fundamental rules. Which brings us to the great magical agent of last class. The great magical agent, if you truly want to have some kind of influence on it, if you want to gather some power and have some reserve of that resource for you, you must accept that it is not organized and it is not predicted or known. Okay? So when you do a ritual to something, you do a ritual of magic or whatever, if you're stuck in the final result, it's way too organized. You have to go towards a temperature or a, a type of experience. Okay, so the temperature is usually happy for us. And the type of experience, like the physics of our ritual will be happy. The heat version, okay? Uh, and But the chemistry is what type of matter or esoteric matter you want to bring and manifest physically. If you're looking to manifest, I take this example all the time. If you're looking to have a house, manifest a house, I want to have a house. You've decided on an object. You're going to be limited by the fact that you decided on a specific object. That object will require money. So I need to earn money so I can buy a house. You're going to limit yourself so much by, by putting in such a, an organized human way the things you want to manifest. What do you want to feel by having the house? Of course, usually in the human planes, you'll have to work and get money somehow, and then you'll have to buy the house. But that should not be the focus of your ritual. It should be your focus of your human strategy, your plan when you, you organize your next step in life. But in magical arts, your desire is to have a space to be happy with whomever you want to be happy. If you want to raise a family, you focus on that. You want to have a place where your children can emancipate. Me, in my state of life, I want a place where I have the freedom to work, play, and be with friends. That's my major thing. Like I want a place where I can emancipate myself peacefully. The peaceful part is important. That is what I nourish during a ritual. It has the chemistry and the physics at this higher scale. It has the convection of, I want to be happy and peaceful. That's the temperature I want. And the thing I want is an area, a space for emancipation, calmly and, and gently emancipated. It's not focused on a house. Then as a human, I'm looking for a specific place to live in that area. Okay, 
that's that's what my focus is on my paper on my on my desk but in the manifestation i know that this is probably what i would like to have a manifestation but i focus on purely the experience because i have to accept i don't know how it's going to come and when it's going to come and when you do magic and when you use the magical agent the more free you are the more your human ego will feel disorganized and not in control but it's 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 not disorganized chaos it's freedom availability to any possibility so that the entropic conviction of karma can come to you and say okay we'll bring you that and the chemistry of it don't be so locked on exactly which atom need to come with each atom because some of them are just not compatible they 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 won't work you have to say this is the kind of feeling i want to live and then then you have you're not deciding in advance how you will live this emancipation or how you will enjoy this kind of thing it's okay to go to feelings like i want a new car is it because you need to go to work no it's because you want to feel them okay focus on that focus on what and then add a parenthesis it also helps me be productive save time and 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 then you get a car or or you don't and and someone happens to uh to be able to give you a ride so part of your things is answered and you know nature has to find a way for for it to mix in your life sometimes in your life there's no money there's no friends there's no opportunity for there's no access for these manifestations to happen so then you have to work on yourself and you have to open up socially make friends or just be available to the world like i want the world to bring me something but i hate the world i'm an introvert and then you stay close you don't meet people you i mean you have to make it available sometimes rituals don't work because the energy comes to the surface of our bubble and bounces on the bubble we have created to prevent it you know so we're responsible for for this dynamic when it becomes very local convection entropy and polarity basically uh, availability to this kind of chemistry on all planes it's the same on all planes so i was going to teach magic and occult sciences and and various various um you know how to summon from life what you want i hope this class helped you understand how you call and then you have to physically plan the possibilities but not be locked in them plan it uh if you cannot execute more than one plan only execute one uh running after multiple rabbits at the same time is not wise you're wasting your resource you're diluting do one uh unless you really have an obvious excess of resource then do a secondary less important one but follow one rabbit at a time hunt for one thing do rituals for one thing and um train for everything like do your malas your mantras for everything but when you manifest focus on what do you want now it could change tomorrow it could change next week but now i'm going to call for this feeling and focus on that yeah i hope the science part of this uh class is not um uh, like confusing you a bit too much but yeah i like it personally that like this is how the universe works the into every plane everything works like that this is how the magical agent flows through all planes and and into creation the more you think and feel in the universal way of shiva okay of the holy ghost of isis then the more the agent is compatible in your life so what is cartesian and organized is how many candles which kind of incense which stone you're going to put 
uh, in the center? Uh, do you have a statue of a, a, a divinity or, or or something else? You know, uh, is there a picture of an archangel? Is uh, w- which spirit of the Arabatel you want to use? Like you are Cartesian and organized in the in the physical fabrication, so that it corresponds to to the call, the chemical call, like the chemistry of which ions you want to pull in. You know, like magnetically you want to attract which kind of causal matter, which is events, what what do you want to live in your life? Then the feeling is, I don't know. You let it flow. And, and it will happen. It will be evenly distributed. I want to finish with a parenthesis on the wolves and the meerkats. Uh, well, actually most mammals and most ancient beings, but they, it's just like I... I've seen it more with these, so um, humans, as animals, have this this respect of an evil flow of resources. But the more conscious and the more intelligent we are in our mind, the more we have structured ourselves in such a way that this convection starts to hit walls and block and now we have envy jealousy greed that just pulls more resource regardless of how someone else has and humans don't have this freedom of conviction in the resources anymore which causes a chasm between uh, the rich and the poor and and the middle class or are not supposed to be the ones who have to balance to the poor so that the rich can keep their richness now, okay? If you have a resource and someone doesn't have that resource next to you, you don't have to give it to them because keeping for yourself the resources that you need now and for a safe future, like prudently planning a good future, that's not narcissistic or egocentric. That's self-love. That's caring for you. Okay, so it's not a problem if you are not sharing what you have in the measure that you believe you kind of need it. Because for many years, there will be a point you won't be able to work. You won't be able to attract more resources, but you'll still be eating and spending the money, you know. So, yes, planning for the future is good. It's wise. And you're not in charge of saving the world and and giving to the world everything you got. Okay, Um, that's important to know. Don't, Don't give everything you got. Um, just recognize when you literally have an excess and then and then let it just let it flow some of you know me personally and have seen me um, at one point just have more money that I feel that I need now and for the months to come I would just take a thousand dollar and give it to someone who is completely broke hey here's a thousand bucks like no one in society would do it and lose it completely just lose that money Now I live in apartments that cost me 480 Canadian dollars per month, which, uh, and it's raising to 500 uh, in July. 500 bucks Canadian is maybe 375 US, more or less, 350 euros. So it's extremely cheap. I live in a basement. I live very humbly. And, uh, you know, my car is paid. It's broken. I don't repair all of it. And, And I'm not uber rich I'm, I'm not rich at all actually I, i'm happy i have what i need so if i was locked in this this dream of being rich you know a joke i often even remind myself and because it's funny uh, americans don't see them poor americans don't see themselves as poor they see themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires okay so <laughs> everyone in in any capitalist country sees themselves as a dreamer of like, if you make it, you're going to get rich. If you, if you work hard, you're going to get a million. If everyone gets a million dollars, everyone becomes poor. Because then the price of bread would be, you know, 10 grand for a price of bread. Because the economy rebalances to the average. Okay. So this this idea that we have locked in such a rigid way our finances has created categories of poor middle class and rich 
And then there's a few uber rich, but rich is like one category for the universe, if you want. It's those who are way above average. It's not a sin. It's still not wrong. Uh, second, when he uh, explained it, that you can be poor and be a bodhisattva in service to all beings. And you can be super rich and not give your money and be a bodhisattva in the service of all beings. It just depends on how you use your resources. Okay, so uh, there's no judgment in being rich. It's actually a blessing and you should be happy if you are rich and, and rejoice and have zero guilt about it. You have not caused the chasm. It happened over millennia. Okay, but it's there. And as you see how it's possible for you as a rich person to remain rich, but how can it flow in a way that will benefit in the most productive way? Everyone, not just the rich that keep to be greedy, but the rich that believe in, I'm rich, I'm going to keep the rich status, but it's going to be useful for all humanity or whoever can help. And I'm not going to lose my resource or my potential. Like There's a way to make that flow and bring back that entropic convection. And sometimes it's organized, sometimes it's disorganized. It's, it's you know, you choose. Okay. You see, it's important to not see judgments in that. In, in those who are poor, those who are rich, those who are middle class. It's important to have zero judgment. All of these experiences are what the soul wants to feel. I want to feel emancipation and, and great luxury. And the soul says, I want to feel like a challenge, having nothing, having fight. The human suffers, but the soul is like, yeah, extreme sport, you know. Um, some souls actually enjoy their their terrible lifetime once and say, yeah, that was fun. Let's not do it again. I hurt my foot, you know. And then you, you stop your extreme sport and you go for a middle class life. <laughs> Don't judge that separation of wealth. Don't judge it. It's there to fit at a causal level the need and desires of people. However, us who are envious, jealous, or greedy are stuck in that machine. And you can't do magic with Archangel Michael or, or Spirit of the Arbatel if you are completely stuck in the predictable and known organized system of magic because the disorganized chaos the unknown and unpredictable will not be able to penetrate your shell right so remember i spoke of separation of class now out of judgment but out of understanding what is your current state of being regarding the natural entropy of equity and charity and how it flows and if your compassion does not include you it is incomplete if your charity does not include you it is incomplete take care of yourself it's self-love but don't be stuck in egocentrism and narcissism okay and that well it will require for you to do some study and personal growth of yourself to understand that all right this year, let's become great mages and whether you do a physical ritual or just the way you think and walk, be a mage in your, in your behavior, in your way of being. All right. Peace, boys and girls, and whatever all other gender you are, and enjoy your evening.